So we go over to our previous problem. Uh, if we look back at the scheduling example, we'll see we start off with our price schedule and then our charge schedule. And we're introducing uh, the exact same problem that we had before. But let's look at, at now how we modify this code that we've already written to uh, accomplish the goals that we had before. So let's look down at our model. The first thing we're going to notice is all of this material here is the same, um, as is the power output and the energy storage. What we need to add is this binary variable. So we now add model.y, which is our binary variable. And that's, again, going to be a pyomo.ver pyomo uh, object. It has the domain uh, model.t. I'm sorry, it has the, uh, the horizon or, or index set model.t. And the domain is binary. So in Pyoma, when we say pyoma.binary, that's a subset of integer variables where the integers are limited to 0 or 1. Um, alternatively, we could introduce uh, a variable where the domain is uh, int integers, and then we'd have to add um, constraints on that integer variable that require it to be either 0 or 1. Uh, but when we do it this way, Pyoma automatically handles that, um, that extra, uh, the extra steps for us. Looking further, nothing about the objective function has changed. We're still trying to maximize price. Uh, we, we maintain the original three constraints, or sort of four uh, plus two sub-constraints. Now, we had previously identified one for storage capacity, one for constraining maximum power, one for enforcing the energy balance from uh, one time step to the next. But then we have to add our two integer constraints here. So the first one we want to look at is the minimum, let's say the minimum run time. So this is the second constraint in the, in the example that we sh showed on the slide. So here we're trying to enforce that the summation of uh, these binaries is greater than or equal to 8. So we look at our constraint, and we define it so that we have this function. We're passing to the function the model. We always have to pass the model. Uh, and then from that model, we're, we're manipulating attributes. So again, we're trying to enforce the condition that when we sum the model for all time, so that is to say we take model.y for every time index in the time horizon, uh, and then sum up all those values, we should see that that summation is greater than or equal to 8. Uh, and then we apply this constraint by adding an attribute to the model, assigning it to the constraint type, and then giving it the rule, which is the name of the function that we wrote here. Note that I didn't include model.t here because I'm iterating over t within the constraint. So if I want to evaluate this constraint for all t, then I would have to pass t as an argument and allow uh, and allow Pyoma to manage that. But here I'm doing summation of model.y sub t within the function itself. So I don't need to uh, implement this constraint more than just once. OK, the second uh, bit of code here is actually the, the first constraint I wrote out on the slide. So let's look back at that real quick. And here we see we want to enforce that uh, the power at any moment in time is greater than or equal to this binary times the, the constraint. And this is now needing to be implemented for all time steps in the time horizon. So we expect that this constraint needs to be uh, written in such a way that Pyomo can call it for a given time index t, check its veracity for every single time step. So we look back here and we see uh, in this case, yes, we do have our, our constraint set up with model comma t, so we're taking in the time index. We're comparing model dot y times w max over 2 is less than or equal to model dot w t. It's exactly the constraint, just uh, flipped around. Uh, and, and we're assigning it, giving it the time uh, set that we want to uh, evaluate this over, and then the name of the function that we wrote. So this code implements the constraints as we've as we've written there, written them, uh, and then we're going to allow Garobi to solve this problem. In the end, then we need to uh, uh, do something with the results. So I've created some uh, statements here that will plot 
time, price, power, and this, the state of the system. Now this is new from last time. We're keeping track of this Y variable, the state of the system, and we'll print that out. Um, and you can see in this example here how you retrieve values, uh, say model.price at T, and then we're formatting it to be a float. And you can look at the Python documentation on formatters like this. Uh, this is now a five wide uh, and one uh, figure after the decimal point float, right? So you can look at how these are done. Um, one thing I'll note is that if it's a parameter that you're calling when you're parsing the, the results here, it's just model.price at the time index. If you're trying to retrieve a variable value in the end, or maybe an objective value, you need to call it as with this function operator at the end. Um, so that's just a minor point to keep track of, but if you don't do that, you're gonna get back some weird results. Uh, the, the print statements won't work correctly. So let's do that and then let's plot the result and, and look at what happens. So I'm gonna run this now. Okay, so here's the result, our, our new result. Uh, the first thing that stands out is that the operating profile is different, right? We now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, values or eight time periods where the power produced is uh, in fact greater than the 50% requirement. So it looks like our constraint is working properly. Um, we also note that uh, it looks like the the power that is produced uh, is pretty much exactly at the 50% mark, which which makes sense, right? If you're optimizing a problem and uh, all the variables are linear, except for these binaries, it makes sense that you're gonna end up either kind of right at the right at the minimum cutoff for those periods in which it really doesn't want to operate but is being forced to. Um, you're gonna operate at the minimum level and then you're gonna save the rest of your, your energy and, and put it into the time periods that are at higher value. And then at some point, you're just kind of left with this residual amount that um, you dump it into the, the best, you know, what you have available into the best remaining time period. And so the results kind of do make sense. We see that the, the storage ultimately is exhausted. Uh, there's no storage left at the end of the time horizon. Uh, and, and so all of this kind of adds up in, in terms of uh, what we're expecting.